Are we live while I'm pulling my sweater off and getting here with you guys so late today? I think we're here and we're officially live. Welcome to today's episode, episode 7 of 10 Minutes with Tara. You guys, I'm sorry I'm so late today. We have some super exciting news and things happening here. Like I just pulled into the office. Drew had an emergency dentist appointment. And so I had to um, take him and then it took longer and then we had to schedule a bunch of stuff. It was so frustrating. Um, so we grabbed some food on the way home. Well, he just got ice cream and sweet tea because he had to fix his mouth. So he wasn't feeling too much, but we pull in and he's starting to come down the drive, um, down, the, down the hill and he goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, or he said something like that, and I'm staring, like, what, what's the problem, I'm looking for an oncoming car, I'm looking for, I don't even know what I was looking for, I thought we were going to die, I don't know, I couldn't see what the heck he was talking about, I wasn't saying anything, and then we start pulling in, and I see our building is completely getting painted, it had been primed and gotten ready um, a few weeks before, but our painter, um, his family went through a really, um, a really rough tragedy in our community and they were kind of the front lines of that and so he had to take a few weeks off to help um, get things back in order and we didn't really know exactly when he was coming back so didn't he come today while I was gone he literally ran out of paint um, they cleaned out Lowe's he's hoping they have more but of course he'll finish it but um, he had to stop where he did that entire building is gonna be like this gray brown something with black trim and it is so stinking beautiful I had to stop I had to film that I need to take a moment tell him thank you um, all the things it is absolutely incredible so I was so excited that building is part of the hundred acres that we uh, just bought this week and it's something that we have been working on for um, almost 20 years at least 15 to 17 years we have been living here working here at the house that I'm in right now this office used to be Abby's nursery and um, we used to live in this house before we bought the three acres across the road to build our house and um, our business so we spent all those years building that up but also we came back across the road in 2015 back over here to work out of the service center we expanded a bunch of stuff for the auto body shop and um, just from there everything grew and it wasn't until this week we were actually able to buy the building the property literally a hundred acres of property um, to get us to this place so that building over there is um, what we're using for salvage and um, some service work but we've mostly moved all that back across the road to the auto body side but the salvage business is going to be exploding out of that building and then there's another building a house over there we're going to rent the top portion out but underneath is this huge open basement so we just need to finish cleaning that out paint the entire thing and we're going to move consider the fields under there that's going to be our warehouse space um, our working space our packing space until we explode out of there and hopefully at that point we'll be buying the store on the corner so there's so many amazing fun things going on and it's like you wait forever for something to happen and then it finally does so my apologies for being late we have our devotional ready to go we have our so will I t-shirt I remember even ordering this one and it was still the effects of COVID and I had wanted a different color and I placed the order and she messaged me and was like this is out of stock and it'll be weeks before we get it back in so do you want to pick something different and I was on my phone on a weekend trip away when I had to make the decision and I was so scared to death because it wasn't what I had in mind it wasn't what I wanted to happen and so I Googled it, I researched, I looked for screenshots of other people wearing this color t-shirt and I knew the ink I wanted was like the chocolate brown. So I was so scared how it was all going to play out and how it was all going to work and it ended up being one of the softest, one of the best shirts we've ever had. It's called a Heather Clay is the color yeah, and it's just one of the canvas ones but I think it might be a tri-blend but even, even so the heathering makes it super soft. So I love that one, and when we did the chocolate color ink to go with it, it was the perfect fall shirt. It was coming out in September, so my hope was to 
fill a void with, you know, like we're headed into fall and it was the first time I ever did a graphic and I designed it all myself and I found these mountains that just spoke to my heart and put the words in there. So this was like a big deal for me. I still get shaken. I had to do graphics for this, um, for August t-shirt coming up and I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing and to not know what you're doing and you want it to look good. So frustrating, so overwhelming. So it has been quite the experience. Um, this is my first graphic, so we're just going to celebrate today the So Will I and what that means um, to all of us. So I'm going to jump in just in case some of you are on your lunch break. Thank you, Lacey. It was, um, I was, I felt like I was running with the big dogs. But anyways, um, I'm going to try to keep it more to 10 minutes with Tara. I know I'm a little long. Um, but yeah, let's let's go over the devotional. So Psalm 1014, even how it says right on our shirts right here, Psalm 1014 reads, But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief, to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. So many times through our foster care journey, I remember feeling invisible. I felt my loneliness, pain, anxiety, and burdens were all unseen. I remember sitting on the edge of my bed just crying, God, where are your people? I was begging him to send someone who could help me, even just someone to hear me. I had never felt so alone and so misunderstood. God did answer my prayers and my cries, though not in the ways I would have thought. He met me in that room through my tears and showed me all the other families in our church and our community that had gone through foster care or adoption. He showed me broken and hurting families, social workers and business friends who walked with broken lives daily, and I had done nothing. I didn't feel condemnation because I knew I had been unaware, but it did put me in my place and give me some perspective that some of the roads he wants us to take are just plain lonely. And it gave me a fire and a light to do something about it for those who come after me. So when I say, so will I, I am saying that I will do the things that I have seen my father do. I will be the helper of the fatherless. My prayer was, Lord, I thank you that you see all the hurt and pain and trouble in this world. I thank you that you promise to walk through those, walk with us through those times. I thank you that you promise us that this world is not the end of our journey, only a small part. Help me to see your people and their hurt and trouble and give me wisdom on how I can help. That it may not always be natural or physical, but that you will guide and direct me even in prayer and quiet answers. Thank you that you have given me a hope and a future and a purpose and that you are with me in dark times and joyful moments alike. You know, that wasn't the first time we had ever, set, you know, gone through something hard and lonely, but I think it was the first time I ever got, like, a spanking, like a God-answered spanking. And by that, I mean, um, I was not feeling sorry for myself, but being frustrated. I was so alone. I wanted someone to help me. Like I really did feel like I was drowning. It was awful and there was no way out. And so the only way through was every day and every day was a nightmare and I just didn't even know we could handle it, how everything would go. And it was a really dark place. So, um, here's me crying out to God, like, where are your people? Like, where's the support? Where's the church? You know, where's, and we have an amazing church family. I think just nobody knows what to do. Like, even now, when I know people um, are going through something, I can cook dinner or bring them pizza or send them takeout or something like that. But outside of that, in the nitty gritty, I, I don't know. I mean, I can offer to take other kids. I can, I, I know there's ways when we look deeper, but I guess my whole point was, how could I ask somebody to like jump in and help us and take care of us when they just, they, they didn't know. And even I've been through it and I have a few ideas, you know, and there's always more and we can listen for that still small voice of what God's directing us to do. But, um, it was just really hard. And the way God answered me was by showing me all the other families, there there were at least five I could list off the top of my head in our church 
that I knew had gone through adoption in some way, maybe foster care, um, <clears throat> kinship placement, taking in kids that were not their own, and never once in my entire life, my entire church life, it had been 15 to 17 years at that point, had I ever thought, wow, that must be really hard. Wow, I wonder if I could help them. Wow, I wonder what I could do for them. And full disclosure, we weren't even here when some of the families were in the adoption process, and I know the church did step up. We had a couple in our church go to Columbia for adopting one child, and they came home with a sibling set of four. And I remember reading the stories on the church bulletin and hearing the stories later while I worked in the office that, you know, the men in the church, once they realized they were coming home with four, went and like built a swing set for them. And um, they, um, you know, all the women got together, whatever, came up with all the clothes and were trying to find, you know, whatever the needs were to bring home what they what thought was supposed to be like one kid, I think, and then now four, and every one of these kids is grown, um, married with kids, something like that, and, you know, some of them are serving first responders, the police officers, and their kids are in Sunday school now, and I just think, like, wow, somebody helped them through that time, and um, someone prayed them through, so I know they had support, and for heaven's sake, you know, we have had so much kindness, so I don't mean to say that, like, you know, it's it's this horrible thing all the time. I just know what we were going through. And I think I've told you before, I asked the caseworker once we started getting to the end of this, and I was like, you just have to level with me. I'm sure I asked them throughout our whole journey, but we were getting to be really close by the end of those two, three years. And I said, you, you need to tell me the truth. Like, are we just wussy foster parents, or is this just a really hard case? Is this just a lot of hurt and heaviness and he just looked at me and he was like this is a 10 so a part of me was like okay like how oh, awesome like I can I can handle a 10 and then a part of me was like god why did you give me a 10 like what even like it was just it's it's a lot and my my main concern was for our family as a whole saying yes to adoption means we're, we're doing this. We're doing this for life. We're doing this forever. And I was concerned about the long term. Could we handle this? Now, you know, it gets easier. It gets better. Life comes down. The appointments were stopping. And this was all even before COVID. Um, you know, we, we were already checking the kids out of therapies. And they were saying goodbye. And they were doing so well in play therapy and their counseling sessions and stuff like that. We, we were leveling out. But what we went through was so hard. And, and during the dark time was when this was coming out of my heart. And the response was, so will I. Like, that's what God's looking for. And I think there's this instinct in us for this self-preservation. You know, we want to make sure we're not going to lose it. We're not going to fall apart. And there is something to be said for having peace in your home and mental stability and, you know, knowing your boundaries and you, you don't go where there isn't peace. So don't misunderstand me here when I say that. But if God is calling you to do a hard thing or he has put you in a situation where it is hard, that's the part in the place where we have to choose. Am I going to wriggle and writhe out of this thing and try to get myself out of it? Or am I going to surrender and I'm going to say, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to trust you that you're a good father. You have a good purpose for this. You're doing something in me and you're using me and you're going through me to make this something good because we know his promises. He gives us beauty for ashes and joy comes in the morning. And sometimes the morning comes a lot later than we ever would hope for, but it does come. And so when God did the thing to humble me and was like, what about all these other families that have walked this walk before you? You're not alone. You know, it is hard, but I am there. And God is into the spirit of adoption. And that's what we were trying to do. You know, so much more than, yes, we wanted our kids to get home, but there was a one-year period when rights were terminated and we were just living in this limbo. 
And through that time, these kids had to hear their biological names. They had to hear complications between court and cases and things getting back and forth. And, um, you know, going through different counselors, dropping, you know, services, and we had to start all over. Or they're still going to dentist appointments to get things fixed from things that had never been done. All those hard things through all of that, that was dragging out. And um, I don't know how many times we've heard, we've never seen a case like this. We've never seen it go like this. We've never seen it this long. We've never seen it this hard over and over and over again. It, and, and there comes a point when you just have to say, like, there is no worldly explanation. We have to start looking up. Um, and I think for us, that was the part that we had to consistently practice and do over and get some mercy and say, um, God is in this. Either he's the boss or he's not. And he's going to lead us through. And there had to be unto the death. Like, whatever my will was, that was going to have to take a back seat to what we were going through. And, um, you know, I think we get really selfish in that way. Um, really, like, in the self-care um, beyond. I, I think we use that as an excuse sometimes to be like, I just can't. But when you um, ignore that voice so many times, it's like after a while you just get calloused and you don't hear it anymore. So I want to be so careful that we don't fall back into that, that we never um, become like that. I, I don't want to be one of the kids when the parent's calling, like, I need you to do something for me. And I'm like, hmm. You know, I got a lot going on. I'm a little busy. Can't do that. Too tired. Already did X, Y, and Z. Yada, yada, yada. I don't want to have excuses. I just want to be like, yes, Dad, I got it. Whatever you say, I, I, I'm there. Whatever you need, I'm going to do it. And so when we say, so will I, it's because we're saying yes to the hard things. It's because we are remembering that there are so many other people. You know, we closed our home to foster care, but our caseworkers are still knee deep in the field, helping kids every day, seeing brokenness every day. Think about doctors that, you know, see these, you, you know, when you're in the ER and you come in with these trauma cases and you don't know if they're gonna make it or not. Um, these first responders, you know, showing up, you don't know what you're gonna find. And in all that, we, we tapped out. Of course, we went on a different journey to do other things, and, and I truly believe that that was God. But they every day say, so will I. And they just step in and they, they do the next right thing that's in front of them. So if there's anything I can encourage you today, whatever the thing is that you're facing, if it's big, hard, and scary, just search for the Lord, find your peace, and then just remember to say, so will I. I'll be right there to cheer you on, to root for you, to encourage you. Um, but never forget, you are not alone. There are lonely roads. But even when you have to take a lonely road, guys, you eventually come back on to the main road. Even when you take a lonely road. Even if the reception is bad. Even if it's, you know, off for you. All the things. Um, eventually, it's going to come back. And um, he's right there with you, all in between. Oh, Mackenzie, what's your surprise? Did you see the building? Are you talking about that? I'm loving how this is painted, and it looks stunning. And you guys do such good work. I'm so grateful for you. But yeah, um, today is a beautiful day of surprises. So look at us on the other side. You know, years later, we're still working on it. We're still healing. We're still growing. And the things I've learned from what we went through... I will never forget it. I will never be the same, and I'm glad for it. I don't want to be who I was before. I want to be deeper in the Lord. I want to understand people better. I want to have that compassion that Jesus had. And I know the things that I saw, the things that we went through, are the very things that are going to be cornerstones for Project Hope and help us grow this program and build the program in the most healing way possible, mixing faith making that the foundation of all the principles that we want to add to that. So I have nothing but excitement when I look forward. When we say, so will I, let it be a beautiful declaration. You can be scared. You can do it scared. Scared is just, yes, your little boy is so sweet. <laughs> 
he was the boss for the day. He was wonderful. And you get to see a little clip of him working with his daddy. I don't know what that did to your heart, but it was good for mine. So thanks for sharing them for the day. But um, we make this declaration, so will I. And um, if you need extra prayer, if you need a friend, if you need someone to listen, I'm one message away for you. Um, I invite you to join us next week when we do October shirt was Superman. That'll be our eighth week, our eighth devotional. And that was Superman is adopted too. So I'll wear my yellow shirt. Uh, and we have the red ones available in the store. We were able to reuse that design and repurpose it because um, Liam and Kimber's brother uh, was getting adopted and his adopted mom has a page called Raising Superman. And that was a theme even before I created the shirt. She was actually my inspiration for that shirt. It made me think about superheroes and you know how we need to recognize adoption and what it means to be adopted into the kingdom into the family of God, you know, there's no, no precursors. Every one of us needs to get adopted in. So, um, I just invite you to check all that out. It's still in the store. If you want to twin with me in a red version, or if you have your original yellow, um, next Thursday, we'll do 10 minutes with Tara for Superman. And I would love to see you all there. I hope you have a great day and, um, I'll see you on the other side.